we're in Colorado. It's, in my mind as a resident, such a sacred place. And I'm not even from here, but I've been drawn here. Can you speak to your connection to Colorado? Um, we'll start with Julia. Can you speak to Colorado and what you think of this land as just the slice of earth that we're on? That's a little bit of a hard question for me to answer, only because um, I see all land as sacred, and all beings as sacred, and I feel that part of the reason we're facing the challenges we're facing as a human family right now is because we don't interact with the world and each other and this planet in that way. And <clears throat> if we did, we'd be living in a much different world. So I think part of the gifts of different places is they have a different resonance, but they're all sacred. And so we can go to different places to experience a different resonance. And I don't mean that as just like a spiritual thing, but literally. I mean, for me, it's challenging here. I have asthma, so <laughs> as much as I love it here, it's hard. The resonance here is a little hard for me. And at the same time, there's definitely a different feeling. And there's a reason why we're all drawn to different kinds of places. Some of us are drawn to the ocean. Some of us are drawn to the mountains. Because something in it speaks to our DNA. It speaks to our soul. Um, and, un and at the same time, underneath it, it is all sacred. And um, I like to remind people that whether we like it or not, when we say we are all one, we are. And there's no asterisk <laughs> with the cl exemption clause. <laughs> because we like to say that, oh, we're all one, especially when we're in this like, wonderful, groovy feeling festival like your eyes, like, yeah, we're all one. And then you go back out in the world and say, except you, because you just pissed me off. Mm -hmm. And except for that person in politics, because they're trying to sell us out. And like, we actually have a little asterisk at the end of that. But it, there isn't one. Whether we like it or not, we all share this same little tiny island spinning in space together. And our challenge is, are we going to, in time, figure out how to live in a way that sees everything as our relatives? Everything. And treats everything and everyone as a relative. And we all know sometimes our relatives get on our nerves. <laughs> sometimes our relatives do things we don't like. Can we find a way to live with the, not only the awareness, but with our actions meeting our awareness that, no, really, we're all one? I'd like to just say a little bit of something about Colorado in particular. Um, and th I, that's so well said, and I, 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 I totally believe that, that it's all. But Colorado for me, because I grew up in the 42nd story of a building in downtown Chicago, and always felt like I was an alien because I did nothing made sense to me in the world, you know? I was surrounded by cement and I just couldn't figure it all out and I just was like, wow, this is a trip, this place. And and then when I was seven, I was had the good fortune of getting sent to Colorado to go to camp for two months every summer right down the street here in Estes Park and live in covered wagons with no electricity and have to you know shovel the poop and the, for the horses and learn how to bridle them and saddle them and brush them and everything. And there's something, well, basically, it, from, from that moment on, the world made sense. And it's something about Colorado to me that is so magical and so incredible because it is, it's nature on steroids. It's like big time, you know, where it's, it's, it's you know, it's our, countries, Kenya, or, you know, I mean, the animals, and the herds, and the wildlife, and the, you know, hot springs bubbling out of the ground, and waterfalls crashing down, and mountains that blow your mind, and it, and, and, and it does this thing that it, it awes people. It awe, the beauty of this state gives people a sense of awe, and unless you have that sense of awe, whether it's from a bird that you see in, in the middle of a city or a you know piece of you know bird flower growing up through the cracks or whatever that that sense of awe and that love you you don't have the desire and the urge to try to defend and protect it and 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 Colorado has a way of doing that and just laying people down you know? <laughs> thank you so I really, really like what both of you guys said, and you know, especially Julia. You know, how you're talking about how mm. all the land, all the creatures on this earth, we are all connected. We are all one, and you know, we are all sacred beings. And I think that it's not that like some people are more so than others. It's just some people have 
lost the recognition that we are all sacred beings. And so for my whole childhood, I'm 13, so not that much, but <laughs> for um, my whole life, I've always grown up in nature, you know, playing in the mountains and the forests, um, catching frogs and finding turtles and snakes in the grass and going to, to creeks and rivers and climbing the mountains with my family and, you know, just <coughs> always being in nature. And I think a part of that just, you know, I, I think just like it's our generation, you know, these days we don't get to experience that, you know, most kids don't choose to experience that because of our society telling us that we have to do this, you know, we have, we're, we are always like playing video games and watching television and, and I think that something that, that was once a part of this generation that I grew up with, of, of being in the mountains and, and, and just sitting in, 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 in the branches of a tree and feeling the heartbeat of the Mother Earth, you know, if I talked like this to my friends or to other kids in my school, they'd think that I'm a freak. And so it's just, I think that in Colorado, you know, I have such a deep connection to the land and to the earth and, you know, really to the people here too. I think that there's something about the people here that's, that's, that's not better, that, that has, has nothing to do with that, but it's just different than the way that I've, you know, because I'm starting to travel all around the world, Brazil to Australia, you know, all over the United States, and I know just something about the community that I feel here in Colorado is, is, is different than, you know, I've, I've felt with the different places that I've gone. And, and so I, I definitely really love that experience of, 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 of just going, stepping out my back door and, you know, being able to run across a mountain. And I think that that is really special for a kid to grow up with. And I think that kids in Colorado need to experience that more, that, that part of them that, that is from the earth. That, you know, we, we all come from the earth and that, that needs to be recognized more in our society and in my generation in general. I have a question for you. How would you suggest empowering some of the urban neighborhoods to embrace that? <laughs> and, you know, at your age, how would you suggest that? How do you help out other kids? One thing is, is like a lot of kids these days are like, I don't want to go in nature, I don't want to get my new shoes dirty or my jacket. Or, you know, we have this like attachment to materialistic things. A lot of times it like stops us from doing things that, you know, our soul, our heart, our spirit really needs. And I think that, you know, kids, though everywhere I've gone, you know, even though we are stuck in this, in, in this way of living of, of consumerism and of, and of technology and electronics, no matter where you go, you know, kids are still like love to play outside. You know, and, and, and I think that, you know, experiencing that at, at different levels and, and, you know, just going to places where, where, where there's a lot of poverty and where kids don't have the option to play video games or to, to check their Facebook accounts all the time. And I think that, you know, when there's a simpler way of living that, that, that people in poverty, that third world countries know that it's, you know, different than, than the, in the United States, Canada, and all these first world countries. And I think that, you know, we can't really force kids to be out in nature. I mean, that, that if, if they're going to reconnect to the earth, that has to be because they want to. But then the question is, how do we make them want it bad enough to pursue it? And so I think, like, as young people these days, we have to be given not only, you know, the inspiration, the empowerment, the knowledge, but, but the tools necessary to, to really experience and be a part of the outside world. And you know, a lot of kids don't have, have, you know, if you grow up in the city, I mean, a lot of times you don't really have an opportunity to go, like, like Daryl said, but, you know, because she got to go to Colorado every summer, you know, that, that, that helped open her life to, to a whole other way that she never could have probably imagined. And so I think that when that opportunity is presented to kids, you know, when, when they begin to, to, to realize that, that connection that they've always had with the earth. When we are born, we are always born with that connection to the earth, with the connection to the animals and the plants and the creatures and the people around us. We have this connection, we are all one. But I think that it definitely takes a lot to have someone that's this kind of lost their way. It, it takes a lot to help them find that and have them see that connection once again. So I was wondering, so here we are at Arise, we're having a great time. How do you guys suggest people keep that focus, that understanding of the sacred, the seriousness of the activation and activity, 
and have fun. Is there a way to balance, especially like in the entertainment industry where you are you're entertaining people, how do you balance entertainment with this oneness and the sacred message? Daryl? Well, it's, it's, I guess that's kind of, um, I, I think that for me, there's, there is no, uh, um, there is no activation unless it comes from a place of love. So you kind of almost have to have the celebration uh, and the, you know, the, the joy and the love of something um, to, you know, to, to have, to, have, to be filled with the passion, to have compassion. You know, enough compassion to step outside of yourself, to to you know speak up and stand in solidarity with others, to uh, to you know to speak on behalf of you know other species or other you know uh, living systems that, that don't have a voice in, in, in their fate. You know, and so I, I, I think that they they do they kind of go hand in hand, and and I mean it's kind of a chicken and egg. You can mix it up to a, a little bit. You know, which comes first, which comes second, but it uh, has to always stem from from that love and from a sense of celebration. So it's a sort of a natural fit, as far as I'm concerned. Julia? Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot I feel like if all three of us answer every question, we're going to be here for a long dang time. As much as I love you guys, I'm, and it's, there's no dust in here, which would make my lungs happy. <laughs> um, we also have a talk to do a little while. So um, I, I'll just say very quickly that um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, a big part of how I have evolved into who I've become is because of a festival. So, um, Paul was a co-producer of a festival in California for uh, over 20 years. And I had been traveling with friends, and when I got to California, I knew I wasn't supposed to go any further. And I didn't know why, but I just knew I, I had to stop there. And I had my experience with the redwood trees completely humbled and blown away and in awe of them. Walked into my first clear cut, was as devastated, as deeply devastated by the destruction I saw as I'd been touched by the beauty and the sense of wonder and awe I had in the redwood trees. And I ended up with a volunteer position at a festival called Radio in the River. And every year they had a theme, and that, theme, that year the theme happened to be um, preservation of the ancient forests. And I heard these great speakers, and there was these amazing people tabling, and all these pictures of activists. And on Sunday night, um, right down the river, August 1997, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to come back and help these redwoods. And so that was an instrumental part in my becoming who I've become as a person in my life. So I just share that as a personal story, that I think if we mindfully mix the joy, the celebration of life. I remind people a lot that the issues that we're facing as a human family are not funny. They're actually kind of heartbreaking and devastating. But if we remember that every time we take a breath, a miracle happens, there's a magic to that. Miracle. <coughs> like, and being human is quite ridiculous, actually, when you think about it. So we just, like, okay, we can find that way to bring in the celebration, the honoring of the sacred, the honoring of the earth, honoring of one another, provide the information in an inspirational container and do what we can to try and advocate for those of us who have a microphone at events like this to encourage people to like take this energy and do something with it in the world. I am a living example of what can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you talk, can you talk about the uniqueness of a rise, what's different about it, and the arc or the change that you're feeling here or witnessing here as a result of the focus? <laughs> I think that the message, the vision, the dream, whatever you want to call it, of Arise is, you know, it's meant to be more than just like a music festival. And when you come here and you're camping and you're with the people and you're listening to the music and you're dancing and you're ex experiencing it, you know, you can feel it, that it's not just a music festival. Well, Arise is a movement. And, and, and you know, it, it goes back before the festival, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a form in which we live our everyday lives that is being brought out in us through music and dance and, and experiencing a, a different way of living. Because you know, not every weekend do we go out and hang out in a place like this and listen to awesome music and feel inspired by different people that are coming out. And, and you know, from things like this is, is where I make amazing connections. And I mean, 
incredible, beautiful people like you two. And, and I think that it's just like a whole other way of, of experiencing, you know, something that you can't learn really anywhere else. And, and I think that the music, you know, like, like Paul was saying, you know, it, it, it draws people, the music draws people to it. And we're all different people, you know, we all have different ways of life, we are all individuals, but when we come together in something like this, and for the Arise Festival, for the Arise Movement, you know, I think this is where amazing things begin to happen. Can you guys speak a little bit about the uh, John Quigley uh, shoot today? Just what it meant for you guys to be there, and, you know, and how that speaks to the Arise experience? <clears throat> um, it was interesting because I know John, um, you know, was, well, this is a first year festival, first of all, and first year festivals are always, you know, a, a more lightly attended than, than once they've established themselves. And, and, and I think also because the, his aerial art piece was going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning and everyone was <laughs> dancing till three or later, um, he was pretty, uh, <coughs> worried last night that he was going to have to figure out a way to draw some kind of an image with three people. <laughs> and so he was, yeah, he was trying to figure out how to scale something that he could make, a, you know, YMCA. Uh, no. But uh, anyway, um, uh, that, that was so exciting. And that's kind of also addresses your question as well, because um, so many more people came than even he expected that he had to make an extra layer of the sun. So, and, and, and what he did is he drew, I don't know if you're aware, he's an aerial artist, he takes images of uh, people all over the world who are you know, facing a crisis uh, uh, and need you know, to get a, a message out to the world and he, he um, has them come up with an image or a, a word or a, 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 or a message of some sort. Um, painted out with their bodies and then takes pictures from a helicopter and, and sends it out through the world. He's done it in the Arctic, he's done it in, in South America, he's done it in the Amazon, he's done it all over the world. And, and he was here today and he did an image uh, with the sun uh, shining around uh, the word arise. And it wasn't so much to brand the festival, it had nothing to do with branding the festival. It had, what the message was, was to, to say, we are going to step up and, and step up to the plate and, and, and take action. We are going to rise up in, in positivity um, to defend uh, the life support systems and, and, the, and Mother Earth, you know. And, and it was really, it was actually, it was I think quite a successful aerial art piece. I haven't seen the image yet, but, uh, but it was really fun because people kept, kept just kind of piling in at the last second. There were like more people coming and more people coming. It was beautiful. Um, so yeah, I think that, that, um, so that was sort of an indication. Already, there's been an action that's been taken from this festival, and you know that that, and that's not even to say how many things might be uh, spurred by you know by some kind of inspiration or connection, like you were saying. Okay, we've got ten minutes. We're in the middle of a series that's um, combining personal brand marketing <coughs> for yoga teachers, musicians, and celebrities with their personal practice. So each of you have a message, and what I'm curious about is how your daily spiritual practice or practice that you do supports the message and also the, the brand of you, what you're doing online and your marketing presence, and how you weave those together so that you are integrating them. And then Julie, if you could touch on for um, uh, when you're having people get their tree, what the accountability piece is as it relates to personal branding. So you're working with them on accountability, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so in their accountability, they're probably delivering a message, which means they have a brand or, you know, they're, they're doing something in their online presence. And where are the contractions around that for people? So another way to say this might be, it's really hard for us to give a spiritual message and make money or have an online presence or devote dollars to marketing. And how, so that's the nature um, of the of what I'm just looking for some sort of um, quotes for, from you guys on. It's not necessarily a specific question, but how are you blending those together? For me, words without action are hollow. Uh, it's a seed that cannot grow. 
And I am, <clears throat> for me, my spiritual practice is my life. I am constantly practicing the lens I live through, and it's my brand, it's who I am. It's so much who I am, and sometimes even when I don't want to be it, it's just being me. <laughs> and that is, I constantly ask myself, what would love choose in this moment? To me, that's a sacred practice. What would love have you choose to drink out of? I use my own mug. That's a daily practice. That is a, it's also something I'm known for. I'm like, I bring my own <clears throat> utensils, which are in there somewhere. I won't try and take time to dig it out. I bring my own reusable napkin. I bring my own <coughs> container. I'm committed that one day this country is going to be so amazing that when we have these amazing festivals, it's cool that they're using compostables. That's that's a huge contribution on, on the part of the festival. It's a lot. It's, it costs more to do that. It's huge that they're doing that. There will one day be festivals in this country where they don't even have to provide that because every single one of us will be having our bag or our backpack with all of our reusables in it. It's not because we should, but because we will recognize it as a way of saying thank you, Earth. I honor you. Thank you, people. I honor you. Thank you, animals. I honor you. Everything is impacted. When even a, even a compostable, the amount of energy and water and resources that go into creating that cup, that even if it gets composted, it still takes more than it gives back. And so for me, that's the way I live my life. It's like life is my spiritual practice. And in a spiritual practice, there's no such thing as perfection. And uh, for me, humor is really crucial. So I'm like, part of our challenge is when we get granolier than thou. <laughs> you know, oh yeah, well you do this, well I do, you know, fill in the blank. <clears throat> and that kind of thing is actually judgmental, and judgment always kills. So a, a spiritual practice never kills off in order to try and find a solution. It heals in order to find a solution. And that's part of how I live my life too. How can I, in this moment, make the most loving, conscious choice I can, knowing that I'm an imperfect person in an imperfect world? And so that means the choice is going to sometimes change as I'm living in this dynamic interaction with the world around me. But that's my brand, that's who I am, and that's what I'm a fierce stand for, because I want to live in a world where we don't see, without even thinking, that the earth is something we can throw away. That when we make a purchase, we are super clear on who and where it came from and who and where it's going to end up, and how, and who and what and where is impacted. That's the world I'm committed to living in. If I want it to exist in the world, it has to start with me. Thank you for that. That was really inspiring. You know? <laughs> 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 the world, starting with myself. And that's definitely been a big thing for me. Um, is you know I'm going out and I'm talking to people and I'm performing rap songs and positive messages and educating and inspiring people and you know um, <coughs> a huge part of that is you know how you live it in your everyday lives. And people will ask me, do you have time to live your normal life, and I'm like, dude, this is my normal life. This is what I do every day, this is who I am. <coughs> it's not just like a mask that I put on when I go out, you know, and, and, and do, do a performance or a speaking engagement. Activism is, 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 is my life, and you know, everything that I do, you know, revolves around that, you know, making conscious choices um, for the earth, for the environment, you know, seeing like how this is gonna impact the rest of the world when, you know, I buy a plastic bottle and throw it away, how, how is it gonna go into the oceans, you know? It, just living with that mindset that what we do affects the rest of the world. And also a lot of people think of like sustainability, this has always been a big thing for me as well, as like sustainability as like renewable energy or like sustainable energy, something like that. But you know, one of the big things is like, we have to get off of fossil fuels. There's no doubt about it. And turn it towards renewables, solar, wind energy. But still, the amount of resources that's going to be taken out of the earth to build the solar panels, to build the wind turbines. Now, as Julia Butterfly said, you know, it's going to take more than, it, than it's giving back anyways. And so I think that one of the biggest things that we have to be focusing on is living our lives sustainably. Because, you know, when you think about it, we weren't always like this. You know, we weren't always need like four cars for a family of two. You know, this, this way that we are living of, of consumerism, of taking more, of buying bigger and better, this society has put us in, in a place where, you know, to, to fit in, we have to live that way. And I think that, that one of the biggest things that we can do to, to get off fossil fuels or, or reduce our energy, because even when we get onto solar energy, we're still gonna be using this much energy. 
we're still gonna, there's going to still be huge demand for, for energy. We're going to have to build more solar panels and, and, and more wind, wind turbines and more wind farms. And still we are growing. You know, We're still going to be getting bigger and there's still going to be a greater demand and more people on this earth. And I think that you know one of the biggest things that we can do is in our everyday lives, live with less so that we can look at ourselves and see that you know I don't really need as much as I thought that I did and 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 w what is necessary is 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 not it's not that much you know back back <coughs> a long time ago you know we were foraging in the forests and we were living in teepees and you know wherever you come from you have your own culture of of, of where where life was simpler and so definitely that's something that we have to start focusing on is you know living our lives simpler and 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 living in, in the moment and living sustainably. We get one more question. Um, here in Loveland, there was recently um, a call for a moratorium on um, on fracking within Yay. the city, um, and then just recently, like in the last like in today's newspaper, um, it announced that uh, there was a challenge against the moratorium, and so that's going to be going to court on whether or not we should be thinking about whether or not we should. Be fracking. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can you guys uh, maybe speak a little bit on? Um, Fracking specifically, and, and what, how you guys feel about that? I'll answer that real quick because um, that's one of the biggest things that my group, Earth Guardians, is working on right now is um, natural gas drilling in Colorado. And I think it's really cool and really inspiring because, you know, we are having like all these different cities, you know, we're saying we want to ban fracking. Fort Collins, Loveland, Boulder, you know, all these different cities that, that, are, that are committed to doing something because we know that nothing is going to get done at the federal level about fracking. You know, we, they're, they're not going to ban it. They're not going to put a statewide moratorium. You know, we, we've tried and we've tried written letters. We've had meetings with them, but nothing's going to happen at, at, at the state level. And, and so that's why, you know, communities, um, people have started building a movement of, of, you know, in your own community, fighting the, the effects of fracking. Because, you know, this is, the natural gas industry is going to do anything to, to, get, to, get their, to get their natural gas so that they can have more money and, and so what they don't realize is the effects that it's gonna have on the community, that it's gonna have on the people, on the children, on the air, on the water. How is this you know, affecting the rest of, the, of Colorado? And, and once they suck up every last ounce of natural gas and oil, you know, they're gonna move to some other state to, to, to drill all of that out. And so I think that you know, it's, that, that, that happened you know, with lawsuits that, that um, I'm working with it. We filed against the federal government for not protecting our atmosphere as part of the public trust doctrine that says that all resources are to be shared and protected for future generations. And um, you know, the, the the all these industries, you know, challenge that. And, and so, you know, I think that it really has to be up to the people to make decisions like this. You know, we can't wait for our leaders, for our politicians, for our governors, for our presidents to do something. We have waited long enough they're not doing their job of protecting our people. Before anything else, before money, before power, before greed, their job is to protect the people, and they have failed at that. So now, it is up to us, you know. It is our turn to be the leaders, and I think that that's what we have to realize in any situation. Mountaintop removal, natural gas drilling, offshore oil drilling, all these things that are, you know, affecting small communities that, that you know, think that, like, we can't fight it. We need, we need our politicians and our governors to do it for us. We have to break out of that mindset right now and realize that if we want to get our community off of fracking or mountaintop removal or whatever it is wherever you live, you know, if we want to get anything done in a situation like this, it has to be from the people. How many how many leases were did they uh, apply for here in this area? Yeah. No, I'm not sure. Okay. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, there were 80,000 leases in the Delaware River Basin, and that's where Josh Fox lived, where, they, uh, uh, where, they, where he uh, started filming the documentary Gasland. And uh, they just had so much resistance from the community there that they just failed. So that's, that's you know, you, you, it speaks to the power of the people. You just, be, you just gotta make sure as many people in the community are informed about the impacts of fracking, the, the toxins, the, the toxic cocktails they put into the fracking fluids, how it will get into their water and wells, also the methane that goes straight up into the air, which is a more potent greenhouse gas, obviously, than CO2 and, and, and is doing you know a lot to hurt people who have asthma and other problems, as well as obviously exacerbating the climate, climate crisis even more. 
uh, and quicker than, than our cars, you know. So, so uh, it can be done. You know, we, you can, we can win this fight. We just have to all show up. So, you know, getting people out there. And that's a lot of what Arise is doing as well. I mean, we, there are, you know, fractivist booths out there. People are doing speeches on the subject. Colorado is, is right now in its gold rush phase, you know, where they're like, okay, it's not regulated. Let's go. We're going to drill everywhere. In front of your house, on your butt, you know, everywhere. I mean, literally, <laughs> like, there's, I mean, hundreds of thousands of leases in Colorado. It's, it's fucked up. Sorry. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's on, and, and it, now they're starting to move to California, too, and they're talking about fracking on the fault line there. I mean, it's just insane. So this is definitely, this is definitely our, te our test right now and the time for us to all 